I once read that in a big survey, more than 90% of people admitted saying the same thing after a car crash. It wasn't a multiple choice question. You had to fill in the blank. Now, this might not be the best time for a chuckle, but count me in that majority now. It hit me. This was the first time I caused the crash. I've been hit before, but this was different. My face met the airbag. Surprisingly, no pain, which is a plus. Radiator fluids have a distinct smell. And yep, that's confirmed. And brake fluid stinks too. That's what I was smelling. Strangely, I wasn't disoriented. The situation didn't unfold the way I thought it would. Not that I had a clear expectation. Another positive note. No smell of gasoline or smoke. The truck's engine had called it quits. Looks like I won't be heading back to work. I had this vision of my pickup smashing into the wall. Glass flying everywhere. Did it happen that way? Oh heck no. It was way more intense. Guess what happened next? My truck didn't just hit the wall. It kept going until it was entirely inside the room. If only I could find a mirror. I'd see how far I'd driven into the place. Stuck to the airbag I couldn't see a thing. Not sure how much time passed. But a guy was urgently asking if I was hurt. How am I supposed to answer with my lips on the airbag? The buzz around me grew. And then a lady screamed. People are hurt. It's bad. No. She couldn't be talking about me. And that made me extra glad. Sirens wailed in the distance. Fire engines and paramedics were on the way. It turned into a bit of a circus. They sorted out the seriously injured. That included me. They hooked up a chain and used a winch to pull my truck back into the daylight. I emerged with a few scratches, bumps and bruises. Meanwhile a second ambulance was busy with a gurney. And the first one had left after stuffing my handcuffed self into the back of a patrol car. Turns out, losing control of your truck can still get you in trouble. At least I wasn't an immigrant facing 110 years in prison. Not sure why they didn't rush me away. This gave me a chance to check out the damage. My trunk had smashed through the wall, taking out the door, window, and air conditioner. It didn't seem to stop until it pushed the bed and box springs into the bathroom. Room 6 and 10 were fine, but room 8 was out of commission. At least it was a single-story building. Guess what got my blood boiling? I saw Joe hanging around the motel. I'm no rocket scientist, but I'm glad I put an end to things. I chose not to talk to the police. Wearing that orange jumpsuit wasn't as uncomfortable as I expected. The catch was... I wonder how the poor people from the motel room are doing. As I mentioned, I thought the truck would just break the window. Still, I couldn't stop smiling. But where are my manners? My name is Vince Clancy. I'm 23 years old, with a friend of the same age. After high school, we messed around and made mistakes. Despite no baby bump yet, Ginny and I got married. Two months later, Ginny had a miscarriage. It bothered me, but Ginny took it personally. After six months of counseling, we decided to wait a few years before trying again. Her mood swings continue to this day. What the shotgun wedding also did was derail our plans for college. Instead of going for a degree, I got a job learning how to be an electrician. Ginny started working as temporary labor, mostly as a receptionist. Many of her gigs are one day, but sometimes she stays for a week when someone goes on vacation. In high school, I played football and didn't embarrass myself. Ginny was one of six basketball cheerleaders. She attended all of my football games, and I did the same for all of her basketball games. While her motive was probably to support me, mine was to keep the wolves away from her. The basketball players and their friends were always doing full court presses, trying to pry her away from me. In my heart, no one ever succeeded. The basketball team's star player was Joe Clark. We weren't friends or even friends of friends. We ran in different circles. But that didn't stop him from making the occasional suggestion to Ginny. Try and be clever. She just laughed it off. I tried not to let it bother me. But being the jealous type, that was tough. I got honorable mentions making all the state honorable mention team. While Joe was just second team all-conference. Those honors go to winning teams. And well, our basketball team wasn't great. Joe got a books and meals scholarship to a nearby Division I school, so he left for campus summer leagues after graduation. Surprisingly, once the season started, he got playing time. When not with players who turned the ball over, he was a decent player. Joe always brought back some buddies for homecoming and the like. One of his friends, Nolan Larson, was the star of his team and a bit obnoxious. 
since his team was in contention for a postseason playoff spot, Nolan was treated like a god. Nolan always hit on Ginny, sometimes even in front of me, knowing she was married. But Ginny just laughed it off. Occasionally I had to step in and make a scene. That just seemed to make Ginny mad. Apparently Joe and Nolan were best buds, as Nolan was always with Joe in his return visits to our town. Instead of putting up with their nonsense I usually found a way to make sure we were busy doing something else. Homecoming was just for a weekend, but summer vacations lasted a lot longer. That was a lot tougher, and several arguments ensued between Ginny and me. Are you my husband or my chaperone? I'm a big girl and can take care of myself. Those guys are just big talkers. Take a break. It's not easy when you're the type who gets jealous. To make things more challenging, Ginny had developed attractively. Cat calls followed us when we went line dancing. Proud? Absolutely. Jealous? Definitely. Insane? I didn't think so. But now I'm not so sure. Mr. Clancy. I'm Scott Jensen. You're a court-appointed attorney. Quite a young man. Maybe just a few years older than me. It's about two o'clock so good afternoon Scott. You can call me Vince. Do you remember crashing your truck Vince? Everything was this an intentional act? Not really. I just wanted to scare them. Didn't know a slow-moving truck could do so much damage. The police report says you were doing about 30 when you hit the motel room. That's not considered slow. When my knuckles turned white and rage washed over me, I might have sped up, but I didn't intend to bust down the wall. That should count for something. Doubtful. Right now you're facing two charges of vehicular assault. If Mr. Larson doesn't make it, they might add attempted murder. Ouch. That bad, huh? Yeah. You sent that air conditioner flying through the room. Hit Mr. Larson right in the lower back. He's got lots of internal injuries. But the upside is it might have saved their lives. The air conditioner made them tumble over the bed just before your truck pressed them against the wall with a mattress. How's your wife? The impact forced Mr. Larson's pelvic area into her, breaking some of her facial bones. She's lost most of her front teeth, and Mr. C Larson has some scars if you catch my drift. Oh, such a pity. Other than that, they're relatively unharmed. Oh no. Far from it. They both have lots of other broken bones. The mattress didn't protect them much when the truck pushed everything into the bathroom tub. Mr. Larson might be paralyzed. I'm trying to shed a tear, Scott. But it's not happening. I understand. How did you know they were in that room? Because after they walked in and closed the door, the number on the door was 8. You're quite new at this, aren't you, Scott? Feeling a bit flustered now. Let me put it another way. How did you know to be there on that day at that time? I was bringing a bouquet of flowers to Ginny as a surprise anniversary gift. If she had time, I was going to ask her out to lunch. She was filling in for someone on maternity leave. As I turned the corner, I saw her waiting by the curb outside her office building. While waiting for the light to turn green, a flashy sports car pulled up, and she got in. I just followed them. So what happened at the motel? Did you confront them? Well, the car stopped at the check-in area, and Ginny got out. I was still waiting on the main road for an opening in traffic to turn left into the parking lot. The sports car went around the building and parked, so I followed. Ginny came out of the office a few minutes later and went to room number eight. He met her around the time she got there. The rest, as they say, is history. So, you don't know what they were doing. You really are new at this, aren't you, Scott? What? Do you think they were planning a surprise anniversary dinner for me? Sloppy seconds. Vince, I'm here to help you. I can't help you if I don't know all the facts. How long did you sit in your truck before you attacked them? A couple of minutes, I guess. And then rage clouded my judgment. I lost it. No sugarcoating it. Complete meltdown. Like I said, I just wanted to scare them. Ginny slowly emerged from her lengthy slumber. She scribbled on the notepad the nurse had given her. Where am I? What happened? Mrs. Clancy, you're at Mercy General. You got hurt when a truck crashed into your room. You have a bunch of broken bones and some inside injuries. The doctor gave you medicine to make you sleep. If you still feel pain, I can ask for more medicine. How are you feeling? Ginny quickly wrote down her next set of questions. Like my face is covered with bandages and my mouth is stuck. Why is my head held still? I can't move my legs or my other arm. Actually, you're in a full body cast. And yes, your face is wrapped up, and your mouth is held together. When you're ready, 
There's a detective who wants to ask you some questions. Can I call him? I wrote sure. It was about three hours later. Mrs. Clancy. I'm Detective Green. How's your memory doing? Writing with the pencil not good, I guess. I don't remember being in an accident. The nurse said I was hit by a truck. What do you remember about Tuesday morning? Writing slowly, you mean this morning? Actually, today is Friday. You've been here ten days. I think they had you in a medicine made sleep. With the pencil shaking OMG I put on a somewhat nicer outfit and went to work. What did you do for lunch? With eyes moving back and forth for several seconds. I went to lunch with a friend. Does that friend have a name? Under the bus. He went Nolan Larson. Where did you go to lunch? Pencils don't lie. People do. I don't remember. Does the Humpty Motel ring a bell? Tears were wetting the bandages on my face. Is that when I got hit by the truck? You should be so lucky. No. You were in the room with Mr. Larson when the truck crashed into your room. More scratching. Someone lost control of their truck. Not really. Seems like your little get-together wasn't the anniversary present your husband was expecting. With a shaking cast. My anniversary. Oh. So this wasn't an activity you'd get prior approval from your husband? Quickly no. That's all I've got for now. Good luck with your recovery. Mr. Larson, can you hear me? The nurse turned to the doctor. He hasn't responded since he was told that he has a broken spine and will never walk again. Sure caught that promising career short, didn't it? From the surgeon. The nurse shook her head. A heavy price to pay for getting a little strange from a married woman. My friends and family offered to post bail. When I'm done with this mess, I'm out of here. The death threats for ending Nolan's career aren't worth being a free man until my trial. I'll serve my time and then... Vamoose. Catch me if you can. Ginny visited me about ten weeks after the event. She arrived in a wheelchair but used crutches to waddle over to the visitor's room chair. Ginny, you're looking spry. Her voice was flat. I'm sorry that I caused this to happen. Did you really mean to physically hurt me? Nope. Just wanted to give you a scare and put an end to your rendezvous. How's your throat? Not funny, Vince. You have to believe me that I'd never cheated on you before. And you broke it up before it went too far. How did you know? Well, I picked up some flowers for our anniversary and was going to surprise you at work. If you wanted out, why didn't you say so? I didn't want out. I don't know why I did it. He was a big star, and I fell for his line of BS. You know he's a paraplegic now, don't you? Yeah, I've been told that. Maybe you should sign him up for the Special Olympics. You two would make a good couple in the modified potato sack race. I guess I deserve that. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry about everything. I hope your trial goes well. Seems like you had a lot planned that afternoon. While sitting in the squad car I saw Joe Clark poking his head around. How do you know you were going to be there? Oh God. I'm so sorry Vince. As the floodgates of tears opened. Truth be told. I wasn't jealous anymore. When my love for Ginny died, it no longer mattered to me what she did or who she did it with. It made me mad at myself for being so gullible. Hey, if you can find where they towed my truck, the flowers I bought for you for our anniversary are probably still in the front seat somewhere. Heard you took a bite out of the big star. How was it? Ginny didn't respond. She showed me her disapproval. Stood up, and made her way back to the wheelchair. Having visitors is always a nice boost. The days passed quickly as my trial approached. I turned down all offers for bail. As the trial drew near I agreed to a plea deal. A year behind bars seemed better than the hefty sentence I faced with the potential attempted murder charge. Hate mail flooded in when the basketball team lost. And death threats followed when they missed the playoffs. It's just a sports game folks. One of Scott's colleagues filed a divorce petition on my behalf. And it was pending with everyone's approval. I'd be single soon. My lawyer made an unexpected appearance. Scott, it's been a while. How's my future looking? Well, the DI is proposing time served plus two years on parole. Scott, tell him I want to leave the state as soon as I'm out. With the ongoing death threats, parole won't cut it. Show him these letters. See what arrangement you can make. The following week, I was transferred to a processing center to complete the remainder of my newly reduced sentence for the Class 5 felony I pleaded guilty to. I'd be out in a few weeks and out of the state on the same day. With my resources drained, a felony record, and no prospects of a decent credit rating for years, 
Things looked grim. Ginny visited again a few days before my scheduled release. She walked relatively normally, with just a hint of a limp. What brings you here, Ginny? We're divorced now. My last visit didn't go as well as I hoped. I wanted to say sorry again. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been there. Well, Ginny, I'm locked up because I couldn't control my anger. That's on me. Period. I don't deny that I was out of control. I could have just driven off, filed for divorce, or disappeared. I'm serving time because of what I did. Not blaming anyone else. Still, you were upset because of what I was doing. Do you like my new teeth? As cute as ever. How about your boyfriends? No need to get nasty. I tried to ignore any story or gossip about them. If I had a wish, and I knew it would be granted, I'd wish you had arrived with your flowers, ten minutes earlier. We'd still be together, and I wouldn't have made the worst mistake in my life. Touching Ginny, but whatever deity you're praying to must not be granting wishes. Where are you working now? I've got a full-time job as a receptionist for stonemasonry. Same daily routine. No husband to go home to. All my fault. What are your plans when you get released? I'm heading out of state. Hate Mail Weekly for ruining Nolan's career. Probably try to live under the radar for a few years. Any room in your plans for a fresh start? Let's talk about this. Why did you mess things up? I wish I could give you a sensible answer, but I don't think I can. At this point, I just want to leave and be on my own. But thanks for the offer. Recalling the good times we had helped me get through this tough time. Well, if you change your mind, you know where to find me at work. You'll always be welcome in my arms. You're right. Until next time. Thanks. But no thanks. Ginny's tears slowly traced down her face. The van ride to the downtown bus terminal happened on a gloomy day. The streets were dry but the sidewalks were still damp. It matched my feelings perfectly. I used my bus fare to go to the city where my parents lived. They had arranged for an old truck for me and a few hundred bucks to assist. They live on a tight budget, so it was very generous of them. My money ran out three days and two states later. There were plenty of odd jobs, but they didn't pay enough for food and a place to sleep. My clunker took me further down the road. Begging on street corners gave me enough money to buy a cheap phone. All I really wanted was to search for jobs on the internet. It worked. I found a construction company that needed an electrician. Cash paid daily. Even though I made friends, I wasn't as outgoing as I used to be. I was staying in a budget motel room at the moment. The lady in the room next door was doing some questionable things, and it got my attention. Let me explain. I wasn't interested in doing what she was doing, but maybe considering her services, though money was tight. She caught me looking one evening and teased me a bit. Ready for some action? Only if you take iOS. Laughing. Let me think about it. No, I doubt you need an electrician. So I don't have anything to trade. Too bad. You look pretty strong. I like a man who can take charge. I'll keep that in mind for the future. Hey, one of my clients mentioned a project that needed some sparks. Can't talk right now, as I need to freshen up before my next appointment. I chuckled. We're just unknown people trying to get through the night. Sleep was hard as I imagined taking charge. I needed some intimacy. It was a few days later when I saw the escort again. She handed me a piece of paper. I told my client that I know an electrician. Here's the number. Thanks, no need for that. I know. See you later. She hopped into her modern car and drove off. I had to check with my coworkers about the going rates for odd jobs. Armed with that info I dialed the number. A lady answered. Surprising me. A bit nervous I didn't want her to discover her husband had hired me. Um. Hi. I got your number from someone. I heard you're looking for an electrician. Yeah. What's your rate, and when are you available? I work Monday to Friday until around 6. If it's a small job, I could do it at night. For bigger jobs it'd have to be on Saturday or Sunday but charging by the day is cheaper than hourly. Hope that works for you. We exchanged names. Hers was Deb, and I got an address for Saturday morning. I showed up as planned and found myself in a gated community. After confirming my visit, I headed to her place in the subdivision. Only one car in the garage so the husband was probably out golfing or something. Deb, about my mom's age, and no rings on her fingers. Something seemed off. She needed the outlet in the master bath replaced and wanted to switch some light switches to motion detectors. There were photos of young adults on her wall, 
but none of them showed a dad-like figure. Her bed had only one pillow. I started to think there might not be a missed Deb. I gave her a cost estimate, and she paid me up front to get the materials. A quick trip to Lowe's, and I was done well before lunch. Deb brought me a soda and a tray of cookies while I worked. So, who told you I needed an electrician? I froze. What should I say? Oh, from the lady at the motel? I'm living and learning. I was just talking about being an electrician, and she overheard. Blonde, around 550. Got it. I have some friends who might need your services. Can I share your name? That'd be awesome. I'm really short on cash right now. What else are you good at? Deb asked, twinkle in her eye. Now, I was confused. Is she friends with the lady from the motel, or maybe a flirtatious lesbian? I blushed, trying to flirt back. I'm young and not afraid to work hard. Let them know, I said, and Deb smiled. My mind wanted more, but I pocketed the cash and drove away. Not even ten minutes later, an unknown number called me. This is Vince. Hey, glad I caught you. Deb just gave me your number. I live two doors down from her. Can you stop by? It was a female's voice. Yeah, I'm just grabbing a bite to eat. What's your address? After memorizing her address, I finished my sandwich and headed over. It took a little while to get past the security checkpoint since I didn't know her name. Just an address. Eventually I was let in. There were two cars in the garage, both with open doors. I parked on the street. My clunker was easily the junkiest vehicle in this neighborhood without a doubt. With a timid knock on her door, I was greeted by a very cute but young lady. Um, you called about an odd job. She rolled her eyes, Mom. It's for you. She turned and left me standing there. A nice view, I might add. When the lady arrived, I could tell the resemblance. You must be Vince. Is replacing ceiling fans something that you do? How about motion detecting light switches? Oh yeah. I need more outlets in the garage. Yes, 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 and yes. Did I answer all? With a wide smile, she said. Come this way then. After jotting down all that she wanted done, I posed the question. Have you bought what you want installed? By the way, should I just call you mom, or rolling eyes daughter? That made her chuckle. Nancy. That's Jeline. She's waiting for her boyfriend, getting really annoyed. Sorry about that. No, I haven't bought anything. We can go down to Lowe's and shop if you'd like. Wait, what's it going to cost to install these things? I jotted down my rough estimates and handed her the piece of paper. Well, let's go. Do you want to drive? Sure. Well, that lasted until she saw my junker. Oh, I'll drive. We can fit things in my trunk and back seat. Well, if you insist. I haven't ridden in wheels as nice as yours in a long time, if ever. It took me until the sun went down to finish her projects. Jolene kept an eye on me, as she fumed about being stood up by her boyfriend. Between the two jobs, I've made close to a thousand after the tips added to my quotes. If you've never lived on the cash in your pocket day in and day out, you can begin to understand the fear of being robbed when you come into a little cash. I didn't sleep worth a crap suspecting that everyone could tell just by looking at me that I had a grand in my pockets. First stop Monday was going to be to open a checking account and get a debit card. With money in the bank, I ventured out on Monday night. As much as the thought of paying the escort for sex revved my engines, I just couldn't take the plunge. Instead, I went to the local watering hole and pulled up a stool at the bar. I wasn't looking, but there were some ladies there that were. You're gonna stare all night. Some of us ladies dressed to impress and you're not even looking our way. I looked up to see a nice-looking lady. I made a production of looking her up and down. Yeah, you do look mighty fine. She must have expected more from me. After a brief pause, she remarked, That's it? Not going to ask me to dance? Not going to buy me a drink? Nah, you're on the prowl. I thought I'd let you take the lead. With a roll of her eyes, she turned away and rejoined her friends. I suspect I was vilified as she explained what a jerk I'd been. I just came in to have a drink and feel sorry for myself. Can't a guy do that without being hit on? Well about 30 minutes later the only one not dancing strolled over and sat down next to me. You're looking the guys over, so I'm guessing you got women problems. Nope. Not anymore. So what's your story? It's taking time for me to learn how to live again. Want to talk about it? 
Not really. I'm enjoying my beer and the view. What's your story? Me and my friends like to come in to drink and dance. You guys all think you're going to get lucky. But that's not why we're here. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of gals who come in looking for some excitement. Mary wants to if you like a little risk in the equation. You're thinking a little town like this that such activities went on at night. We don't consider ourselves a little town. So you must be one of them big city slickers. Yeah? I guess so. Never got into the nightclub scene. Why is that? You ain't half bad to look at. Got married early. Money was tight. So our nights out were limited to parties at friends' houses or a movie. Didn't work out. I guess that's why there's no ring on my finger. Bingo. Well, I came here to dance. If you're not going to ask me, I'll catch up with you later. Ashley's my name. I'm Vince. Nice chatting with you, Ashley. I'm getting really good at making women roll their eyes and shake their heads in disbelief. As I lay in bed that night, I realized it wasn't sex that I desired. It was companionship. Simply talking with Ashley had lifted my spirits. I became somewhat of a regular at the watering hole, eating dinner almost every evening. Not looking to hook up, but simply to talk. The next time Ashley and her crew came in I asked her to dance. Although invited to sit at their table, I declined. Conflicting emotions had me wondering which way was up. I received another referral call from the work I'd done for Deb. This lady's address was in a different part of town. My Saturday morning was now booked. The following Friday night, I was sitting in my usual spot, enjoying a pickle, hard-boiled egg, and pretzel mix, when I felt a tap on my shoulder. Looking up into the mirror, I saw her standing there. Hey, Ashley, where's your posse? Watering the horses. Grab your dinner and join me at a table, she said as she turned and walked away. That sounded more like a command than a request. So I did as I was told. I sat down and asked, Can I get you a drink? She declined saying, No, thanks. I know money is tight for you, so I'll buy my own. Surprised I questioned. How do you know about my money situation? She replied, Well, let's see. Your clothes, your car, your food. Should I go on? Busted. I've simplified my life. Let's learn more about each other. I have a college education and a job at a warehouse distribution center, though I'm not fully utilizing my education. My choice was to move away or stick around until something or someone came along. I'm not married, never have been, no steady boyfriend. Now your turn. I opened up about my past, how I impregnated my high school sweetheart, and our rushed marriage that ended with a miscarriage. Discovering her infidelity I drove my truck into the motel room. I spent time in prison and the guy is now paralyzed. We got divorced during my time behind bars. I pulled up the story on my phone and handed it to her to read. After a moment, she returned the phone. So, still want to get to know each other? I asked as she studied my face. Must have been a shock to your system. Believe it or not I never meant to harm them, but the law didn't see it that way. Sitting in that prison cell my heart turned ice cold. It's been about a month since I got out, but appearances can be deceiving. Anything else you want to know about me? I work in electrical jobs, getting paid in cash. Lately, I've taken on weekend gigs for extra money. No run-ins with the law, except for the day I let my anger get the best of me. I paid a heavy price. How much are you planning to spend here tonight? About twenty bucks. Why? She suggested. Let's go to the thrift store and get you some decent clothes. The angel and devil on my shoulders argued. Woman. Trouble. Woman. Trouble. Eventually, I accepted her offer, and she drove. I questioned. Why are you doing this? She replied. Because you won't do it for yourself. You're too young. And it's time to move on. Curious, I asked. What's in it for you? She teased. If I still think you're a nice guy, I might ask you to take me out. That night I spent thirty bucks but got several shirts and a couple of pairs of pants. Ashley drove me back to my car. As I stepped out, I thanked Ashley, and then I asked her out. To my surprise, she said yes, and told me to wear one of my new outfits. We planned to meet at the mall's movie theater at six tomorrow night. That night I couldn't sleep. It was one of those toss-and-turn nights. Following in my routine, I did an odd job on Saturday morning, 
even though I had almost $1,600 in the bank. I kept $50 out for the evening. Ready at 4 p.m., I realized my only pair of shoes looked awkward with my upgraded outfit and jeans. So, uh, I went back to the thrift store and found a decent pair for under 10 bucks. What I thought was a date turned out to be a double date. Ashley brought her friend and her date along. Being a convicted felon, I shouldn't have been surprised when people took precautions. Despite feeling excluded from most conversations due to their college memories, I enjoyed the movie and drinks afterward. The hug, more than the peck on the lips, was what I missed the most. Feeling pleased, I handed Ashley a slip of paper with my phone number and a short note. She didn't share hers, and as she tucked the paper into her cleavage she whispered that she would call if I hadn't scared her away. Things were going well, but they took a turn on Tuesday night. While filling up my truck with gas, I spotted Ashley arm in arm with a guy heading into a nearby restaurant. We were only friends, and it hit me hard emotionally. All the anger, heartbreak and helpless feelings came rushing back. Just when I thought Ginny couldn't hurt me anymore, her memory stabbed me again. My instincts kicked in, and I decided to find a better place. I wasn't ready for a relationship. It wasn't Ashley's fault. With my motel room paid up until Friday, I had a few days to figure out where to go. The decision was easy when the guy I worked for mentioned someone needing an electrician. By Friday morning I was on the road with 500 miles ahead. While driving, I answered my cell without thinking. Hey Vince, where have you been? I took a job in a different city and left without calling. Thanks for your help. When are you coming back? I don't think I am. But I'll keep you in my contacts just in case. Her voice sounded sad. And maybe I should have called sooner. No biggie. I enjoyed our time together. A few more minutes of reminiscing. And my time with Ashley was over. Although my parents wanted me to visit during the holidays, they understood why it wasn't the best idea for the next few years. Sooner or later, another basketball star would appear, and thoughts of Nolan would fade into history. I dated a few ladies and even went to a swap party with one of them. While I loved the variety, it killed any thoughts of spending more time with that one. When you're just someone's ticket to the party, it tends to demoralize you. Cold fish. That's what a wise person once told me. My heart was hidden away safely. Keeping your horse undefeated means keeping it in the barn. And the same goes for my heart. If it never sees the light of day, it can't get hurt. It took three years before I visited my parents back home. Things were good enough that I could afford to fly. Especially since the basketball team had made the playoffs, making it safer for me. No one brought up Ginny, which I appreciated. The return flight was uneventful. And I even chatted with a lady about my age on the plane. No names or phone numbers were exchanged. I'm Heather. I work in the cafeteria in a big office building downtown. Just off Broadway. I'm single, waiting for Mr. Wright to come my way. There's a loner who eats here every day, always picking a piece of cherry pie. His name tag says Vince. He works for an investment bank but doesn't dress like a banker. There's something intriguing about him to me. Since Vince wasn't wearing rings I thought I'd take a chance. One day as he was putting his tray away... I told my boss I needed to use the restroom. Instead, I waited for Vince. And when he approached, I simply handed him a note that said, Call me sometime. Heather, along with my phone number. I grinned. And he responded with a smile. Simply nodding yes. A few nights later, we decided to meet for dinner. Nothing fancy. Just at a cafe near my place. It turned out to be quite an eye-opener. Vince shared about working as an electrician and handyman for an investment firm. The surprising part was that he was a convicted felon, and he pulled up an article on his phone about it. This happened four years ago, he said. Do you miss her? I asked. Not at all, really. So, how come a good-looking guy like you doesn't even have a girlfriend? I wondered. Risk versus reward, Vince explained. If I put my heart out there and it all goes wrong again, will I snap? So it's about trust, I guessed. I guess so. If my trust in a girl is misplaced, do I trust myself to handle it gracefully? Vince continued. He then shared how he had seen her with another guy three years ago, and all the pain came rushing back. Okay, I think I get it. I said. We'll take it slowly. But only if you promise to ask before assuming. I don't want things to blow up because one of us assumed something that just wasn't true. What if I still don't want a relationship? Vince questioned, 
Then we won't meet here tomorrow for dinner and a movie down the street afterwards. I could see uncertainty in his eyes. He slid his hand across the table, and I placed mine over his. After a few moments, Vince softly said, See you tomorrow. Butterflies fluttered inside me as Vince silently left the cafe. He might be Mr. Right. All right, let's talk about what happened after. It wasn't smooth sailing. Now, Vince needed assurance that I belonged to him, and only him. He's not just into sex. He loves cuddling too. I can sit in his lap reading a book while he watches sports. As we got closer, Vince became really possessive. It wasn't easy, but we made it through. Understanding why he's the way he is has helped me accept it. We've been married for ten years. I've turned down dance requests. Except from his dad at our wedding. No girls' nights out for me. I make sure to invite Vince when I go shopping with friends. We have a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. In between I miscarried and we needed counseling. The counselor and I convinced Vince to attend extra sessions. He's been through a lot, but he's mine. I doubt I could find a man as loving as Vince. I know his struggles. And every day I remind myself not to give him a reason to doubt my love. If you've made it to the end you're the person I'm sharing these stories with. Hit subscribe like, and I'll catch you in the next episode.